to Real Democracy Now. I'm Nevek Thompson and Real Democracy Now is a podcast for people who think we can and should improve how democracy works. This podcast looks at democracy from different angles to help you think about how democracy might be improved. Hello again and welcome to episode 18 of season one of Real Democracy Now, a podcast. If you're a regular listener, you know that season one is all about deliberative mini-publics. So far, we've learned what deliberative mini-publics are, why they work, why they are popular, and how they are being designed and run around the world. We've heard a politician's perspective, as well as the perspectives of participants in these processes. Today, I'm talking to two academics, Professor Graham Smith and Professor Brigitte Geisel, who have developed frameworks to assess the effectiveness of democratic innovations, including deliberative mini-publics. Whilst their frameworks have some similar elements, their conclusions about the value of deliberative mini-publics is quite different. First up, I speak with Professor Graham Smith from Westminster University in London, who has developed a framework of democratic goods to evaluate the effectiveness of various democratic innovations. My guest today is Graham Smith, Professor of Politics in the Centre for the Study of Democracy in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Westminster in London. Graham's research interests encompass democratic innovations, environmental politics, and the relationship between modes of environmental governance and pro-environmental social practices. He is also the chair of the Research Committee of Participedia, a global network and knowledge platform for democratic innovations. I've invited Graham onto the podcast because he has written a fantastic book, Democratic Innovations, Designing Institutions for Citizen Participation, where he sets out some key measures we can use to assess whether particular democratic innovations are really democratic. Welcome and thanks for joining me on Real Democracy Now, a podcast, Graham. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Great. So look, before we dive into your book, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be working in the area of democratic innovations? I know you didn't start out as a political scientist. That could be a long story, but I'll try and make it short. Initially, I was working around the area of environmental politics as an activist and in terms of my work. So as an activist, I was involved in anti-road building protests. And this is where the Department of Transport was trying to build a lot of roads through very environmentally sensitive areas in the UK. And really, the question I was asking is, how do we get to this point? How do we get to the point where we had to undertake direct action? And that led to a a long analysis and critique of, of how decisions are made and how citizens don't get involved until too late in the process. And at the same time, or sorry, a bit later, I was working for a county council and was trying to do public engagement around uh, environmental issues and finding it incredibly difficult to engage people. I was incredibly amateurish. I didn't know what I was doing. And so when I actually started a PhD, it was on environmental politics, but it was on the intersection of environmental politics and democracy. And so I got very interested in the question of how do you um, develop processes which give citizens a meaningful opportunity to participate in environmental decision making. And that led me into discovering, um, it was at the time of citizens' juries were emerging in the UK. Then I heard about participatory budgeting. And suddenly I got much more interested in issues of participation than I did in issues of, of environmental decision making in particular. So really it was that move from trying to understand why it was that people couldn't get involved in the environmental decisions uh, that affected their everyday lives to a more generic question of how can we do participation better. So, Graham, in your book, Democratic Innovations, Designing Institutions for Citizen Participation, you identify the concept of democratic goods. Can you tell us what they are and how you use them? Okay, so one of the issues I was facing when I was trying to analyse different democratic practices like Uh, many publics and citizens' juries was the tendency for them to be analysed from one particular uh, theoretical perspective. So, for example, deliberative Democrats would be particularly interested in the qualities of many publics or more participatory and agonistic Democrats would be looking at participatory budgeting. And I was trying to think about developing a more, what I would call a more ecumenical theoretical framework, one that didn't necessarily rely so heavily on one particular theoretical tradition. So the way I started thinking about it was, what are those qualities that we expect from democratic institutions? Uh, What are the kind of, as as I said, as the term I said, what are the goods 
the democratic goods we associate with those um, institutions. And I recognize that um, as we fill that out, we get very affected by a particular perspectives that we bring to the table. But I wanted to start from that more basic question about the qualities we associate with, with democratic institutions in particular, sorry, democratic institutions per se, but then democratic participatory institutions in particular. And so can you just take us through what the democratic goods you identified are? Yeah, sure. There were four that I think are of, of primary importance. Um, and I think that they come together in different ways to make up other goods and values such as, a, such as accountability. But the four that I chose to focus on after, um, after a long, long and exhaustive period of having long lists and then cutting them down and then extending them, et cetera, was, was with the following four. The first is, is inclusiveness. And that looks at the question of who is present in participatory processes. But the who is present isn't enough. It's also about who's able to voice their perspective. So inclusiveness kind of has at least two dimensions, a question of presence and then a question of voice. Um, the second uh, is popular control. And that asks the question of the extent to which those participating are actually able to have a control over both the agenda of what they're uh, engaging in, uh, the process, and also uh, final decision making. That isn't to say that you expect every participatory process to have full popular control, but something you, a question that it's reasonable to, uh, reasonable to ask of any participatory process is the extent of popular control. Uh, the third good is considered judgment. And this is the question of the way in which democratic institutions create the conditions such that participants are able to understand the issue at hand, uh, understand that they have enough information and enough detail of the issue which they're participating on. But not only that, but also understanding of the perspectives of other, of other people. In a democracy, it's not just about our own opinions, but it's actually understanding those of others. So considered judgment has those, those two uh, categories, both uh, understanding of information and understanding of the perspectives of others. Of others. And then the final uh, good was the good of transparency, and that's both transparency and, and openness for those who are participating, but critically, transparency to those not participating. We have to be realistic that most uh, participatory processes are going to, at any one time, involve only a, a part of the population. Is that process transparent to the rest of the population? So it's those four goods, inclusiveness, popular control, considered judgment, and transparency. And I, and I think those are the sorts of goods that we associate with um, democratic institutions in general and participatory processes in particular. And so I know that in your book, you actually apply those mm -hmm. um, democratic goods in an assessment of, uh, I think, about four different uh, mm -hmm. types of processes. Can you take us through in detail for deliberative mini publics um, and perhaps in uh, less detail for some of the others, <laughs> what you found when you, when you did that application of um, those, you know, you assessed those different processes against those democratic goods. Yeah. Okay. So, so our focus here is particularly deliberative uh, mini public. So that, that, that um, your listeners will be, will be more aware of sort of randomly selected bodies, which uh, provide the participants with information and opportunities to deliberate and typically coming to some sort of recommendation. There's a range of different types of mini publics, um, you know, citizens' juries all the way through to uh, G1000s and citizens' assemblies. But they're only one type of participatory process. And I was really trying to capture in the book the fact that participatory processes come in many different forms. And very often, actually, in democratic theory and democratic practice, people say we need more participation, but they don't think about the different implications of different types of participation. So I compared uh, deliberative mini-publics to three other categories of um, institutions. The first were institutions based on open assemblies, if you like, anybody can come. And there, the exemplar I used was uh, participatory budgeting as practiced in, in Brazil. The, uh, another category was direct legislation, which is the use of citizens' initiative, popular assemblies, direct ballot, um, where citizens have the opportunity to put an issue on a ballot and then vote on it and it having um, legal and constitutional status. And then the final category was a kind of um, a rump category, if you like, which was an emerging area of e-democracy and is still emerging, very difficult to try and 
capture the kind of dynamics of what's going on there. So I, I try to use the goods to look at these four different modes of participation. And unsurprisingly, I suppose the finding that main finding that comes out is that no uh, one of those um, forms of institutions can realize all of those goods, all the four goods I mentioned fully. Any, it, any institution, and this isn't just about participatory institutions, it's also about democratic institutions in general, will always be a trade-off between those four goods. And if we think then, you asked me specifically about um, deliberative mini-publics, what are deliberative mini-publics particularly um, good at? Well, first of all, they're incredibly good. In, they, they, uh, they do incredibly well in relation to inclusiveness, using um, forms of um, sam random sampling, uses of quota sampling, etc. You get a, a highly inclusive body in terms of presence, and then in, in the way that uh, facilitation is used cleverly within these institutions gives different people very often who have never really engaged politically an opportunity to voice their perspectives. They also do incredibly well in relation to considered judgment, I believe. And this is where, you know, citizens involved in mini publics learn a lot of detail about the issue at hand. Uh, and not only that, but they come to be confronted by um, and understand the perspectives of others who they would not have come into contact with, people with very, very different views. So I think many publics um, in many ways are exemplary in terms of uh, achieving inclusiveness understood in a particular way, understood in, in a sort of uh, in terms of um, random selection and then in terms of considered judgment. I think where they do less well, if I'm honest, tendency is very often the agenda has already been set for those citizens. So in terms of popular control, the actual task that has been set is, is one set by public authorities, typically with, with little engagement of citizens. And then in terms of the actual effect, we, a lot of research has been done, which tends to show that many publics are poorly coupled with decision-making processes. I know in Australia, uh, there's been some more successful examples, but there's been a lot of many publics around the world where uh, they've been held and yet it's quite hard to see what happened to the recommendation. And I think the second challenge for many publics is, this tr is, is in relation to transparency, not in terms of transparency to, see to participants, but transparency to those people outside of the mini public. It's very often hard to get, for example, the media interested in reporting on mini publics. It's not seen necessarily as sexy politics, uh, sort of going to an institution where people are trying to understand each other and are being reasonable to each other doesn't sell newspapers, strangely enough. So I think where many publics have got more work to do is in relation to popular control and aspects of transparency. But in terms of inclusiveness and considered judgment, they're really uh, quite phenomenal. And were there any of the others that you looked at that sort of did better in the areas that uh, deliberative mini publics did badly? Yes, it did better is an interesting issue. I mean, there, there's a different kind of balance involved. So, for example, obviously, direct legislation does incredibly well in, in, in terms of agenda setting and uh, political decision making because citizens, although let's be honest here, many, very often it's not citizens bringing, bringing forward issues, but citizens have the capacity uh, potentially to bring issues onto the agenda and uh, they have final decision making power. They, they vote at the end and that vote, if it passes, it becomes law or it, or it leads to constitutional change. So they have very significant um, power, but there are issues here around considered judgment about do people understand what they're voting on? Do people, do people understand the perspective of others? I think participatory budgeting is an interesting one. It, I think, does incredibly well uh, as it's been, as it's been um, established in, in Brazil or, uh, historically. Partly that's actually because participatory budgeting isn't one single institution. It's a series of different institutions, open assemblies and then more representative citizens' assemblies. And it's been a clever, it's been a clever interplay of different institutional designs. And I think that actually is important for those of us thinking about mini publics and that we shouldn't just think of mini publics in isolation. We can think of mini publics linking with other forms of participation. And here I'm thinking, for example, of um, the British Columbia Citizens Assembly, which was a mini public, which then led to a direct vote, a, a ballot on its recommendations. I'm also thinking here of the Citizens Initiative Review that happens in Oregon, where a 
when a measure gets onto the ballot, there is a uh, citizen's jury which provides a recommendation to the public in relation to the kinds of information that's available uh, and has, has been shown to have quite significant effects on uh, people's decisions. So I think, I think many publics do well in relation to other institutions on certain goods, less well on others. But, and there may be one of the things we need to do as, as political scientists and I guess democratic activists is think more carefully about how we position many publics in relation to other participatory processes. And I certainly see that happening um, in a lot of places. In Australia, you know, many publics are combined with, I guess, used for participatory budgeting processes with a range mm. of um, add-ons. So I know, for instance, in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne City Council ran a people's panel, which was basically to look at their budget, their entire budget. And as well as having a deliberative mini public that had both citizens and businesses represented on it, the council had undertaken a very broad based community engagement process in the lead up to that. And that became input to the people's panel itself. So, you know, there is a lot of dynamism, I think, in the field at the moment. Yeah, and I, I, agree. I think it's that kind of thinking of, of sequencing of participatory processes and participatory moments, which is really critical. And probably the, the, it, the fault of political scientists and, and maybe sometimes practitioners thinking that there's a silver bullet, one single institution which will solve all of our sort of democratic problems is a mistaken way of thinking. Yes, I think that's right. It makes the field much more interesting as a result to sort of look at how you can sequence and uh, put together in other ways, you know, different approaches, combining them and so on. Next up is Professor Brigitte Geisel from Goethe University in Frankfurt, where she undertakes research into democracy and democratic innovations. Thank you very much for joining me, Brigitte. I've spoken with Graham Smith about his use of democratic goods as a way of evaluating a range of democratic innovations. I know you've developed a different framework for the evaluation of deliberative processes in particular. Can you explain your approach and uh, tell us about what your approach tells us about the impact of these sort of processes? Um, okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this podcast. My criteria I have developed to assess different kinds of democratic innovations, not only deliberative procedures, but also direct democracy or new forms of co-governance, are based on five criteria which are developed from democratic theory mainly. Uh, the one is inclusive participation, which means does the device guarantee that participation includes a variety of different people and groups and not just specific groups or people. For example, only the well-educated or those who are able to discuss in a very elaborated way. So the first criteria is inclusive participation. Can everybody take part in this form of democratic innovation? The next is meaningful participation, which means does the democratic innovation has an actual impact on policies or outcomes? So do, do they really make a difference? Do they uh, have an effect on what they are supposed to have an effect? Change policies, make life better, whatever. So meaningful participation is the second criteria. The third is legitimacy as perceived by citizens, which means is the procedure and the outcome perceived as legitimate by the citizenry? This is, my, I mean, a classical criteria of democracy that it is perceived as legitimate, that people agree mm. and support the process as well as the outcome. So legitimacy as perceived by, by citizens is the third criteria. Then the fourth is, is the democratic innovation effective in the sense that it allows or that it leads to the fulfillment of shared collective goals of a constituency. So are these shared collective goals of a constituency reached when this democratic innovation is, is used? A shared collective goal is, for example, health environment or things like this. So the question is, can these democratic innovations help to reach these collective goals? And the last criteria I have developed is citizens' enlightenment. So can the democratic innovation help to improve citizens' democratic attitudes and democratic skills? So these are my criteria. And the question is, what can many publics do? Of course, and I think we come to this in the next points, of course, it all depends on a, a lot of different variables. And I'll discuss this more in, in detail later. Um, but when we look at what many publics can reach up 
to know or what many publics really, um, whether they really have an effect. The effect is not so much on meaningful participation. Most mini, most mini, uh, most many publics don't have so much effect on actual policies. Um, whether they are inclusive or not, or of course depends on the design, they also don't have so much up to now effect on legitimacy as perceived by citizens because most of these mini publics are rather small and most of the citizenries don't really um, see what's going on and they don't really know what's going on. So the effect on legitimacy is on the side of the citizenry is very small. It's higher on the side of the participants sometimes, but since these mini publics are small, so the, the effect is not so so big. Also, the effect in the sense of like the, what, I, what I talked about, effectively reaching shared collective goals is up to now not very strong. I think the strongest effect uh, is on the um, enlightenment of the participants, which means that always participants improve their knowledge, their, their democratic skills, their political interests, attitudes, and so on. So when we look at mini publics today, I think the most important impact is that it enlightens those who participate in these mini publics. This is up to now. As far as I can see, the most important impact. And that sort of fits with some other work you've done that I've read where you've, you've sort of identified micro, meso and macro levels of impact. And am I right in thinking mm -hmm. that your, your five criteria sort of fit within each of those? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's something I made up uh, in, another, uh, in another publication that I said, when you look at democratic innovations, we can... We have to differentiate between three different levels of impact. The one is the macro level, which is the level on the policies, which I said now that's meaningful participation. It really has an impact on policies and on outcomes. And it's effective in the sense that it leads to reaching collective goals. These are the macro impacts, the, the impacts that are really for the whole society. Then we have the meso impacts, which are re referring to the group, what's going on in the group. And the micro impacts, which refers to the to the participants, what happens on the on the level of the participants. That that is what I was talking about: the enlightenment of the, those who participate. They when they learn and uh, improve their knowledge and so on. So this is uh, the micro impact on the level of of the person of the individual. So exactly, these are the three macro, meso, and um, micro level impacts of democratic innovations. Mm -hmm. This is more in an abstract form, and I was the five criteria I was talking about was more in a concrete form, but yes. in an abstract form, it's exactly what you said. It's the macro level, it's the societal level, which means the societal level, the meso level, which means the group level, and the micro level, which means the level of the individual person. Yes, yes. And so, as you've said, in your work, you've looked at other democratic innovations. What's your view how deliberative mini publics meet those criteria? Are there other democratic innovations that do better across the board or is it more just that they do better in some areas? I mean, I know Graham Smith's work just talks about it as a sort of combination and that nothing in no one uh, innovation currently meets yeah. all of the criteria, his criteria. What about with yours? Yeah, I mean, that's the same for me. It's not only Graham Smith, it's also uh, Michael Sword and others and, and my work uh, that we say no democratic innovation can fulfill all tasks, but it's always a combination of representative and different forms of participatory devices. And when we look at deliberative procedures, they are, of course, more able to um, new ideas to discuss solutions. So they are more better working on the will formation process, so to say. I mean, when we say democracy is always about will formation and will formation and decision making, then deliberative procedures work best on the will formation, discussing, finding good solutions, finding the best arguments. When it comes to decision making procedures that are inclusive and well for all citizens, then I would say direct democratic procedures, referenda, are much more appropriate because they are more able to come to concrete, come to conclusions where everybody can be involved and not only a small group as it is possible in many publics, of course. Using that example of the referendum, um, I think there's mm -hmm. been a lot of criticism of the, the Brexit referendum on mm -hmm. the basis that people didn't have the chance to 
be well informed. Another thing that I've heard people talk about is sequencing and you know combinations mm -hmm. of innovations. Mm -hmm. Do you have a view on how that might work? Of course, the sequencing is a, it's it's the best thing to do to help people to think about issues they have then to decide on. With the Brexit, of course, it's difficult. No, I have to uh, look at it from another point of view. When you look at Switzerland, for example, where they have lots of experiences with direct democracy, with referendums, people are much more informed and much more able to make up their mind on the topic they have to decide on. Whereas in democracies where people have much less opportunities to make up their minds and make decisions in direct democratic procedures, of course, they often are not so informed. They are often not so, um, they don't know how to get the information and so on. So I think like everybody has to learn and also democracy is something we have to learn. Um, so making good decisions is nothing that just happens, but it, it, it takes time and people have to learn how to make good decisions. Having said that, I don't think that politicians always make best decisions. I mean, there are lots of <laughs> decisions made by politicians. Yes, when we well, we would think, oh, my goodness, they should have thought a little bit more about it before they make this decision. So I think it's on both sides. Citizens don't always make the decisions that we think are the best in the world. And the same is true for politicians. For me, Brexit is not an argument um, that people are less, not enough informed or cannot make good decisions. It's on both sides. Your work is focused on a range of democratic innovations. But if we come back to deliberative mini publics, what do you think their value is in improving the quality of democracy? When we discuss the effect on the quality of democracy, of course, we first have to see what is democracy? What is the quality of democracy? How do we define it? Does it mean that it's well-working institutions and fair elections? Does it mean that you have responsive politicians um, who actually serve the people? Does it mean that you have democratic citizens who trust or who are politically satisfied? Or does it mean that you have a political system with good performance, like good life for the people? So you see how the question is what you mean uh, when mm. you talk about quality of democracy. That, that differs quite a lot uh, when you look in the literature. The next point is I don't think that mini publics ex as such have an effect because there are so many different kinds of mini publics in so many different contexts. It all depends, of course, on first the design of the mini publics. For example, who can take part? How is the selection of participants organized? How is the mini public connected to decision making bodies? I mean, do parliamentarians, do mayors, do presidents um, take part? Are they involved? Um, so, this is the question about the design of the mini public, which makes a big difference. Uh, the second question is the commitment of the politicians and the citizens. If politicians are not committed to the mini public, if they just ignore it, then of course they cannot. Mini publics cannot have a big effect on the quality of democracy. The same for the commitment of citizens. When citizens just don't take part, they ignore it. They are not interested. Then mini publics cannot have a big effect on the quality of democracy. And the third is of course resources. How much resources are available to support the mini public? with moderators, uh, with media coverage, and so on and so on. So these are just a couple of varia variables that are important, that play a role um, in the question whether many publics can have an effect. So far in Season 1, most of the people I've spoken with see the value in deliberative many publics As you can hear from today's episode, this positive evaluation of deliberative many publics is not universal. In next week's episode, the last one for season one, I talk with people who take a more critical approach to the operation of deliberative mini-publics. Professor Christina Lafont from Northwestern University in the US, Associate Professor Caroline Lee from Lafayette College, also in the US, and Associate Professor Genevieve Fuji-Johnson from Simon Fraser University in Canada. I hope you'll join me then. And before I finish up this episode, I'd like to thank one of my listeners, Philo451, for a wonderful review posted in iTunes where he or she says, Loving the different perspectives I'm hearing and the podcast is really well put together. Against the sense of loss and sadness of 2016, this is kicking 2017 off to feelings of hope and optimism. Can't help but feel I'm on the start of a journey here. It really made my day to read that review. If you're enjoying the podcast, why not let me know by writing a review in iTunes or Stitcher 
or on the website or send me a tweet. Thanks for listening to Real Democracy Now! You can find more about today's topic in the show notes at www.realdemocracynow.com.au. If you enjoyed this program, please subscribe to this podcast, write a review, share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation on the webpage or on Facebook or Twitter. I'd love to know what you think is the essence of a real democracy. (laughs) 